Hey everyone, welcome to the Capital City Bourbon Show. This is your host Luke, and I'm here with my co-hosts Alex and John. We're thrilled to be here with you all today, so grab yourself a glass of whiskey and come join us on the porch. Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another episode of the Capital City Bourbon Show. This is your host Luke, and I'm here with my co-hosts Alex and John. How are we doing today, boys? I'm all right. Merry Christmas, Christmas to everybody listening. Happy yes. holidays. Y'all have a good Christmas? Not too bad, you know. Good. Good. What about you, James? I did, I did just fine. Stayed right. at home with the wife. We didn't do anything. Right? Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But I did find a little uh, little liquor while I was there. Just a little bit, huh? Yeah. I, I thought you might. So uh, we are ex- very excited to be here today. This is an episode we've been looking forward to recording for quite some time now, and uh, we have two very special guests with us here today from Whistlepig all the way up in Vermont. We have Emily Harrison and Megan Ireland, who are the master blending and distilling duo from Whistlepig. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, we have we have a lot to talk about, and um, even more importantly, we have uh, some great whiskey to drink, and we definitely want to dive into that and then start tasting, but, um, you know, we, we'd just like to hear a little bit about you and, and, and your backgrounds and how you got started at Whistle Creek. So um, we both have degrees in chemical engineering. I got mine from Clarkson University. I got mine from University of Louisville. Um, and for me, I, wa- I knew I wanted to get into this industry. Uh, I had read an article in Whiskey Advocate, actually, about a woman master distiller whose degree was in chemical engineering. I think after my freshman year, and I was like, oh, I can use my degree for that? Like, that's, I want to go in that direction. Um, so then after graduating, I ended up being in the hard cider industry for about a year and a half before this job opportunity opened up here and I moved, moved out to Vermont for it. So. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. I, uh, being from Kentucky knew that I wanted to get into this business pretty early on in my, uh, my school career. So after school, I, uh, went to one of the big distilleries in Kentucky. And then, you know, after some time there, a position at this small distillery <laughs> up in Vermont opened up. And, um, you know, I came during leaf season, um, so I think they trapped me that way. Broke her in. It was beautiful. It was, it was so beautiful. It was fall, and, you know, it just has this, Whistlebake just has a spirit of innovation at the heart of it that uh, it really, it really roped me in, and I've been glad to team up with Megan here to, you know, make some fun whiskey to so- do experiments. So out of curiosity, how how has the experience there at Whistle Pig been for you? What is what has been your progression along the way to uh, get you to where you are today? Um, <laughs> it's kind of cra- it's kind of crazy because we all wear a lot of hats here. We're we're growing still. We're only a ten year old company. So on the farm, there's only about twenty five of us who show up, who are here every day at work. Um, So I came in, my title is actually technically the quality assurance supervisor. Um, So I do that part of it, but then I also am on the blending side and I do a lot of the logistics for all the liquid as well. And along with that, I run our single barrel and our single finish program from a logistics standpoint. So all of those kind of things just kind of developed over. I've been here for about two years now and developed and grown over those last two years. Yeah, my... I'm kind of similar where I started as the, I'm the distillery manager here. And, uh, you know, over time you start to take on more roles. Um, I've become the person to go to for barrel procurement, capital project management, uh, just, you know, anything I can get my hands on, I'm going to do. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where we ended up here. Is that where you guys are doing all the, the blending and barreling and aging up at the farm? Um, yeah, so we have a lot of our, most of our blending all happens here and our distilling happens here. We do have our barreling facility is actually over in New York state, like 20, 20, 30 minutes away. Um, so most of our barrel warehousing and aging happens over in New York. 
Gotcha. Awesome. Well, uh, we are all big whistle pick fans. We, through Market Square, been able to do a lot of barrel picks, and uh, I think we have one. Uh, you don't have one, two coming in. Um, yeah, we bought just two barrels recently, and we named them the uh, one of them the Lost Year, and one the Big Move. We just recently rebuilt our facilities uh, last year. Uh, but I, I can't wait for those two to come in. I mean, when we tasted them, I was like, oh, my God, we couldn't just pick one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, so uh, I'm, the, I'm the person who sends those samples out to you guys. And then when you fill out your form and stuff, I, I, I start I start the process of getting it filtered and put into a bottle and all that. Well, that's awesome. It's great to put a face to the name on seeing who's yeah, helping us behind fun. the scenes. Well, so Emily and Megan, you were kind enough to send us um, – some samples today. This is something I, th I think is really unique, and, and we've been very excited to to get into. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about what we're going to taste today? Yeah. So today we're going to taste our deconstructed Boss Hog Seven. So our Boss Hog Seven is finished in two barrels. It's finished in Spanish oak as well as South American teakwood. So you have two samples in front of you. One. Three samples in front of you. I'm sorry. You have the Spanish oak, the South American teakwood, and then the final finished product. So while tasting through these, you're going to be able to see what each barrel contributed to the finished product. So we just poured the, the base whiskey here. This is a, it looks like a 17 year old at 108.2 proof. Um, so I, got, I got mine right here. Oh, <laughs> perfect. All right. Awesome. Cheers. Yeah, this is uh, just already knows that this is a, just a lovely experience. So the base whiskey, this is where where you're starting with before you you go from there to blending. How does that work? Right. right. So this is um, kind of we pick we flag stuff throughout the years ahead of time of like, oh, this this is good. This is a really good one. We, we're going to do something special with it. So this is one of those batches that we had flagged that way um and it just when we went back through and we tasted and we sampled it really hit us and we were like wow this could be amazing and this is what we're going to use this year for boss hog it's got some really strong like rye dice notes to it that we loved um and we, and we knew that a finish to it could really make it special and this is a blend uh yes oh. yep. yeah man that that rye spice Ooh, talk about finish. Um, you know, for 108 proof, there is no heat on that. Like, it's perfect. Yeah, I agree. It's like liquid candy. I mean, this is so easy to drink. And at 108, I mean, that's that's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, I just spoke. I'm sorry. It's not a blend. I didn't hear your question right. I processed that afterwards. Um, oh. So this is just one. Oh, it's a single barrel, and and you you flagged any number of barrels over a period of time that will be used for it. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, well, this this is a great barrel. <laughs> uh, for a, yeah, exactly. I mean, dang, you guys hit it out of the park right on the base whiskey. That's why you're producing some good juice up there. I mean, that's very well balanced. You know, you can taste the rye, but it's not too sour or too citrus or it you know it's just super well balanced that's some really good juice right there yeah uh dangerous <laughs> uh, so then what's the next step from here once you guys get a base whiskey barrel ready to go then what's the next steps um, so we do a lot of research into kind of what we think will be cool and fun to work with um this Megan mentioned earlier our single finish program. So our single finish program is kind of one-off cool finishes, interesting barrels that we've picked out. Um, yeah. And that's that's where this year's South American Teakwood barrel actually came through that program. So we had found that finish probably about two years ago and, yeah. and kind of decided that this year for Boss Hog is, is where it was going to really hone in and shine. But our first finish was actually um, the Spanish oak that we used. So yeah. Emily did a lot of the footwork on that and a lot of the communication. Yeah. So Spanish oak is an interesting wood. It's very heavy in tannins. So we knew we didn't want to do a super 
long, I guess, aging process in it. We wanted to do a shorter finish in it um, so that it would absorb some of the tannins, get a little bit of that flavor, clean the whiskey up a little bit, but it wouldn't overpower that that beautiful base liquid right there. We just wanted a, a cleaner finish to it before we put it in that final South American teak wood. Let's do it. Let's try that. Yeah, let's try that one. So how long did you guys do the finishing in that? About eight weeks or so? No, only three weeks. Really? Wow. That yeah. so that fast, it already started picking up characteristics of that wood. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And you'll be able to tell us. Soon now, as are you using the, uh, the uh, Spanish old barrels or staves to, to season it? Barrels. We used full barrels. We contacted a cooper in Spain. Um, great guy to work with, and he uh, he took some convincing. Um, <laughs> Spanish oak is notoriously difficult to work with. Uh, it's a very knotty wood. It uses about three times the wood that you would no- use for a normal barrel, just because of how many knots you have to cut out of the tree. Um, but he finally he finally came around to it, uh, and he told us he hoped we weren't putting anything expensive in it because uh, it was going to leak all over the floor. Luckily, it didn't. <laughs> he wasn't. Luckily, it didn't. He, he should did. have been more confident in his work. But yeah, we we got him to make full barrels of Spanish oak. Those are new new in. new barrels, brand new barrels. Yep, brand wow. new barrels. Wow. But you can sure pick up the uh, you can pick up the oak. I'm poor. Much more than four weeks, <laughs> you, I think would have been a problem. Yeah, that would have overfinished it for sure. I mean, that's crazy. Just three weeks, it already it changes the profile so much. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, just on the nose, even I haven't really dived into it yet, but the the difference on the nose is amazing. I mean, for that short period of time, uh, the amount of balance it added to it, and you know, calming that rye spice a little bit, and, and Picking up more of that oak, I, I would have thought that would have taken a lot more time. And that, that's really impressive. You can definitely taste the tannins coming off of the oak on there. So so was it charred? Because I'm really getting the oak taste, the same, oh, same thing as you no, might it was smell. Not it was, Go ahead. Yeah, it, was, it was a heavy toast on it. Was it? Is what we ended up going with. We didn't end up going with the char. We went with the heavy toast. In order to really bring out more of the vanilla and uh, like probably those oak characteristics you're picking up, like the vanilla, the like beautiful wood notes that really shine with a toast but can be burnt out with a char. Um, that's that's kind of where we landed on it. So what's, what's the difference between a toast and a char? Oh, so uh, a char is. Um, so if you're looking at a barrel, a char is that like heavy uh, black uh, alligator skin type, but like, you know, that that texture that you see on the inside of the barrel. Right. Where with a toast, it's actually just heated. It's not burnt. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's like the difference between like toasting the mar- marshmallow and lighting it on fire. Got you. Where toasting the marshmallow, you know, will bring out the vanilla notes and really emphasize the marshmallow flavor where with if you light it on fire it's it's gonna also get some charred some char <laughs> get so, some char on it as well so so what do they normally uh, uh, just distill from these spanish oak barrels the people that you got them from so they're not used super often in general. I wouldn't take um, no. Most of the time they are used is in the wine industry, though, because it is um, a, a more viscous drink and less likely to spill out of the barrel. Not spill yeah. out, but to leak uh, out of the barrel. Yeah, Spanish oak is lacking in uh, this material. Um that's like a, a gum type material that uh, is found in white oak that seals it. So you usually use a more viscous liquid to go into it rather than a very thin spirit like whiskey. Well, it kicked it up a notch, didn't it? I mean, it, yeah. it, 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 it yeah. absolutely took a, 
gave it a totally different personality. Yeah, now it's starting to taste like that high octane rye, you know, that 108 proof. It's still very, very easy drinking. Absolutely. Um, a great mouthfeel to it. I'm just, as I continue to sip it here, it's just really giving it a nice, thick, viscous mouthfeel and, and still tons of that good rye flavor, but that oak definitely. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, prominent. I mean, from the base, the base is getting all, all the palate centers like right down the middle of my tongue, right? And then once you get the Spanish oak going, it's kind of like a full mouth feeling. It's activating everything, getting all the flavors. Yeah, that's uh, very so then from, from Spanish oak, you guys took it to teak, and that's the last finishing. Yeah, so um, as we said, we had kind of experimented around with the teak wood before. And at the end of the three weeks of the Spanish oak, we were like, okay, this is really great. But we need it for boss hog. It's got to be super special. Um, so the way we kind of got to that is going back to the single finish program, looking at it, seeing what kind of finish could really bump it up, which is where we had this teak wood. Um, so we were able to find a supplier for it and get a few more barrels, a lot more barrels. <laughs> teak is South American, right? Yes. Yep. Um, so this is only a three day finish. Yeah, so yeah. this is where I think the, the impact is, like, super interesting. So you go from that three-week finish, but as soon as you hit this three-day finish, it gives it so many more baking spices, um, really changes the nose to it, but you still get your rye, your powerful rye on your... Yeah, I, you know, you mentioned the nose on it. These, it's This is really blowing me away, just how it changed. So much in that period of time. Three days. I'm kind of getting a mintiness off of it on the end. Yeah, that, that is, that's just crazy that that short period of time. Now, the, the teak barrels that you guys use, were those toasted at all or just straight natural finish? Or? A medium level toast is what we ended up using on the South American teak wood. Are you doing the toasting, or are, you, or are they coming to you that way? They're coming to us toasting, but yeah, yeah, we uh, we request them at a certain level. Um, I mean, we we work with our suppliers the whole way through Pretty to make sure that time, yeah. Huh. yeah. So, what gave you guys the confidence now to say, "Hey, we're going to do a Spanish oak finish, and we're going to do a teak finish"? Things that have never been done. I mean, what was the source of that inspiration? Could you go? That's a bold route to go. And I mean, you guys put out something really amazing, but how did you manage to connect the dots from here to here? Yeah, so a lot, a lot of it is the environment here at Whistlepig. Like we have, we're able to experiment and do a lot of innovation here, which leads us to be willing to take these risks because we've done a couple other innovations and other experiments that have led us to be like, okay, th this can work. This could possibly be our next step or the way we want to go. Um, so I think a lot of it is just the culture and the environment here at Whistlepig. Kind of, I, I've never been afraid to try something new here. Like they 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 encourage it. Yeah, so. I I mean they they encourage innovation to the point where I'm having my distillers next year. Just uh, they they get 25 of their own mashes and distillation runs that um, they can do whatever they want with. They can order their own grain. They can order their own yeast. Uh, they can they can do whatever they want with as long as it ends up in a barrel. Um, we'll figure out what to do with it for you down the line, but you know that's that's where we're at here. Where we just we just want to experiment, and if something great comes out of it, great. And if it ends up just being a great you know single barrel that someone ends up wanting, that works too. So so when when your different distillers are are, are doing this, are they? Are they utilizing the 53-gallon uh, uh, barrels? I mean, are they working with full barrels when they're making all yeah, They're working with things? full barrels. They're working full scale on these innovation projects. That's that's kind of the great part about running a small distillery is that our full scale can be innovation-sized for us. Yes. Yeah, so we have our numbers to hit, obviously, but innovation is always part of our schedule and part of our routine here that, that we're encouraged and pushed 
to do. So. Well, it certainly shows in your product and, and the different boss hogs that you've come out with, and, and frankly, all, all of the different whistle pigs, each one of them seems to have its own personality, but they don't step out of character uh, so much. You, you you stay in character without keeping that, uh, you know, Pepsi Cola sameness <laughs> throughout the whole process. And I think that's um, that's a rare talent in a, in in, a, in and of itself. And I, I, I don't know how you managed to do that, but congratulations. I uh, would also add that, you know, the the base whistle pig was delicious. So, yeah. so the, the very idea that you might try to change that was pretty pretty bold <laughs> to, begin, to begin with. I mean, I would have bought that barrel as is. Yeah, that and, and, yeah. And then when you hit the uh, the Spanish oak to it, it it gave it some uh, big boy, you know. Talk to you type of thing, and and I, I envisioned a bunch of guys with a lot of rings under their eyes around the table drinking that stuff. But then by, by the time uh, you put that teat to it for three weeks, is that right? Three days. Three days. Three days. Three days. Jesus. For three days, and and it smooths it out, and it, and it just seemed to cut the, the the rough cap of that Spanish oak off, and I, I'm, I'm amazed that it did it. I'm yeah. amazed that it did it. I'm amazed that someone said, "How do we how do we uh, knock the top off of this thing?" And 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 it and it works. It's going to be a great. Is it already on the shelf? Yeah, yeah. It came out um, in October, I believe. So what kind of response? Uh, so far, it's been great. It's been a very positive response across the board. We're super excited about it. Um, me and Emily had a big a big hand in this one. So for, for both of us, it, it, it's been great to get the feedback. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. Man. And just like he said, like you could have bottled each one of these in, on its own and crushed it. I mean, each one of these would be a fire skew. I would pick them up and drink it myself, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's just the way you guys manage to connect the dots. I mean, my hat's off to you guys. That's awesome. That is open it up. That base whiskey is so fire. I just can't get over that. <laughs> yeah, I think I might revisit that one because that, I mean, that is just a phenomenal ride. And the end product is wonderful, but, you know, taking something so great like that and and, and putting it through this process just changes it so dramatically. But and, and, I, in a good way, to be clear. Um, but it really was so interesting to see how you you took these different barrels with these, these different wood, and the impact was just, it's still blowing me away as I, as I taste through it. Yeah, I mean, now let's open up a whole realm of possibility in one thing. From, from your first glass that you have there to, to your third one, it's a total of three and a half weeks, and that's it. Um, Wow. I, I would not have thought that would be possible. I, I mean, you know, just that short period of time, the the beginning product and the end product are so different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you guys do anything special when you're when you're barreling these in oak and tea? Are you doing any kind of special placement in a rick house or just wherever it's going, it's going? No, not really. Basically, it, it, it's kept e easily accessible. <laughs> yeah. We, um, so that we're able to, I mean, we know this wants to go towards Boss Hog, so we're tasting these, especially the first couple barrels on a daily basis to ensure. Um, so, so it's basically the fact that we need it to be easily accessible is where it sits in the warehouse. Yeah, we, we taste these on a daily basis to see it. Where we, want. Where, where we wanted to go and I think everyone was everyone knew that teak would finish would be short right that, that was the one where that was pretty shocking we had how many weeks of finishing we oh. originally so like when we test our first barrels we do it for for longer than what we think we're gonna want it so as we taste it every day we were like oh I think this is our sweet spot but then we let it go for another week or two to make sure that that's kind of the over finish and that's what um so for the teak wood we actually ended up in our experimental barrel for that one, finishing it for two weeks, which at the end of the two weeks was just, you almost lost your rye flavor to it. 
Right. I mean, it was great. You had a lot of those baking spices and vanilla notes and stuff, but like when it comes down to it, like Boss Hog's got to be a big, bold rye. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I'll, I'll ask the same question about the um, the tea barrels. What are those normally used for? I've never, I've never heard of it before. I think that was used for Kasasha finishes, I believe. Um, it's it's another one that's kind of rarely used in general, uh, let alone for liquor. So I think Kasasha was the only other thing we really, we really found saw it. That. We saw a few beers that were finished in it, um, but those seem to be more like experimental rather than a, a standard. So, so you found a barrel maker that will make these barrels for you out of whatever you want to make make them from? No, we have a few different barrel contacts. Um, they all know that we're interested in experimental things. So, you know, they'll, they'll throw them at us, see if we want them. Um, and when we find something unique or, you know, we read about something that we really want to try. Because the South American, or the, sorry, the Spanish oak was one that we had only read about. We had never actually tried anything with it. Um, so that was the one where we, we hunted down someone to see if they would make it for <laughs> us. But most all the other ones we get are just barrel brokers that know we're kind of down to try anything. So they'll send us their list of cool, weird things they have that no one else really wants. And uh, we'll, we'll grab them <laughs> if we go for it. <laughs> the barrel guys are up to their ears in demand. But... Uh... I think that's great. I, I'm, I'm I'm so impressed talking to to both of you and and a few of the other people that we've talked to. I'm so impressed with what this younger group of experimental folks and, and I include you in that are bringing to the table for for those of us who've been drinking pretty much the same same old bourbons and ryes for, for quite a long time. And and just in this short few months that we've been tasting some of these things, I'm, I'm seeing, wow, I mean, this this is just expanding uh, the palate and, and the enjoyment of the, of the, of the liquors. And you, this is one great example. You've done a good job here. And it's a high price point. I mean, you know, you know this this stuff. They don't give it away at the liquor store, uh, so it has to be good. So you have to be good. And, and congratulations to it from 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 our side on what you've been able to produce. We we've been huge um, whistle pig fans. Absolutely. Uh, we I think we were early early on buyers of the brand uh, at at Market Square Liquors, and I bought one personally as well for a uh, yep. charitable situation and and I never would have thought I would have bought one until I tasted it and said I gotta have this and and that's what you're doing and congratulations. So really quickly this is from the Magellan this is the new boss on bottling right is this is this is the first part of the series and then there's gonna be another release for Magellan's trip back or something like that. Yeah, so this is a uh, Boss Hog 7 called Magellan's Atlantic. Right. Um, so the story kind of came about because <laughs> I think we kind of showed up to marketing. We were like, look, here's our Boss Hog 8. And they were like, really? Spain and, and South America, you want us to try and figure out how to the connection for this story? <laughs> <laughs> we <were> like, yeah. <laughs> like, trust us, like it's delicious, but now they got to figure out the story. You know what I mean? Um but we've got a great one planned for, for next year for Magellan's. Uh, I'm assuming we're calling it Pacific, but to be honest, I don't know. Um, it's a marketing's problem. I mean, that makes sense, right? <laughs> for the second part of the trip, though. So, yeah. Yeah, we're already working on that. I'm excited for that as well. It's We're trying to live up to this one. So, what is, is there possibly a, a, a bamboo barrel on the horizon or something like that? I don't think we can talk about it, but we're, we're trying to live up to this one. <laughs> just just so. blink twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, was, I didn't want to pry too much. I was, I was going to ask about that, but I kind of figured I'm pretty yeah. easy to keep that under wrap. Uh, it's actually a cool thing on, the, on these bottles for Boss Hog 7. On the neck label, there is a cord in it. And everyone can go online and register your bottle. And then there'll be 
you'll you'll be able to complete your journey next year. So it's a cool little little fun thing to go online and be able to register your bottle and have that journey and that connection will be made. So um, well, I mean that's the, the whiskey is great, but you're you're really just you know adding to it that that kind of concept and, and letting every individual bottle kind of be registered and yeah and you know giving that that end user experience is, is really cool and i mean i mean it sounds like you guys are having a blast up there at the farm it sounds like a tech company in silicon valley <laughs> not a can i come hang out with y'all okay, not <laughs> having guests when uh covid doesn't exist so <laughs> Especially <laughs> barrel buyers. We love having barrel buyers up here. Um, yeah. Megan and me yeah. will lead you through the tasting of your barrels and give you the distillery tour and tour the property. It's it's an absolute blast. We also have two new piglets you can feed. Yeah, we just bought two new ba- We got two new little baby pigs, too. So that's our new adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember when y'all were talking earlier this year, Alex, about setting up a, a trip to Vermont. And obviously yeah. everything got... Cancel every yeah, control cancel. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would I would personally love to get up to the farm just to see your operation. Given we're all such big whistle big fans, I mean that's that would be a, you guys are gonna end up having to kick us out because we're gonna bring in the food never leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, with this type of whiskey, I mean, why would you? Exactly. I mean, we could hang out all day and just drink and and enjoy. As long as you also feed the pigs, you can stay as long as you want. <laughs> is there, That's no problem. <laughs> so that, that brings up an interesting question. As we were getting ready for this episode um, on social media, we kind of advertised this a little and said, you know, we're sitting down with Emily and Megan. Do you have any questions? And and one of the questions that was sent to me was, where did the name Whistle Pig come from? Can you all speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so it's kind of a funny story. Um, the original owner here had been out on a hike in Col- out, out, out west in the Rockies somewhere, I think in Colorado. Um, and someone had been coming down the mountain and ahead of him was like, watch out for the whistle pigs, watch out for the whistle pigs. Out <laughs> on the west coast is apparently a groundhog. Is that what we refer to it as here? But um, <laughs> but that name just kind of always stuck with him and that like weird experience where he was like, what, what is that? Like, what? <laughs> um, so that name though, and that concept just kind of stuck with him. So when he opened up this place, that, that was the name that that was given to it. <laughs> That's great. That pretty funny. It was just kind of a funny random story that it was a word that kind of stuck with him. So... <laughs> We frequently get reminded that whistle pigs are groundhogs, not actual pigs, but uh, I think I prefer our actual pigs. So, so one of the other questions we got in, um, and this is probably a, a pretty typical question, but what you know is, is there a particular flavor profile that you you shoot for with just your standard whistle pig releases? I mean, that's a difficult question, but I guess maybe if you could just kind of speak to how you go about sourcing. You know your whiskey. I, I know you're distilling some now, but you know what? What was your process for for you know your kind of your standard ten year product? Yeah. So for something like ten or ten, twelve, fifteen, our standards, we have uh, we have a consistent product that we're shooting for. Um, so through the sourcing that we've done, uh, aging, and then it's just consistently going back and like bonds we have flagged for certain things that we think have the right profile for it. And then going back six months later, as we're getting closer to it, say hitting 10 years old, checking it again, still making sure it's on track. So it's, um, it's a, it's a game of kind of learning where you want it to be almost a year ahead of time, two years ahead of time and being able to flag that and know and kind of continue to watch out for it as you get closer to that age point. We have a tasting panel that does a really good job of narrowing down um, what flavor profile we're shooting for and ranking it on a scale. Yeah, so we, we have a team here. We all work together to be able to, to hit those profiles. Yeah. Well, and I know you all have sourced Canadian rye, but now you're, you're actually selling your own distillate, right? Um, so our own distillate goes into our farm stock product. Um, 
it's still relatively young compared to all of our other stuff. Um, so we weren't quite comfortable putting it out there as a 100% yet because it tasted young. Um, so our most recent farm stock, the one that has the most in it, is 52% of our own stuff. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. I've seen that bottle at Market Square. And, yeah. Um, I wanted to, to, you know, taste it because I, I, I knew that was your own distilling going in, and I, and I have, I have no doubt it'll be wonderful. I, I've never been disappointed with this one. Any product I've tried, I've pretty much tried all of them, all of them. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, there's never been disappointment. So I'm, I'm definitely interested in trying that, and and, and obviously. In coming years, you know, as that distillate gets a little older, I'm, I'm excited to try it. And, and, uh, and yeah, we get to see the progression of it now. Yeah, know? absolutely. And that's great. It's also the bonus of working with small companies that are growing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of cool with like, our, we, we have three farm stock releases at this point one, two, and three. And every year, the fraction or the percentage of our own has gotten bigger and bigger. Um, so, kind of that progression that's happened there. And then we've got some inventory this year up at around five years old. So we'll start to really look into it and see what profiles that's going to fit. That's great. Nice. So I kind of asked this question, you know, obviously, you know, whistle pig is, is synonymous with rye. Is, are we ever going to see a whistle pig bourbon? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not the tough question. <laughs> Again, blink twice. <laughs> We're definitely synonymous with rye. Uh, I don't know if we'll branch into anything else. Um, we do get to experiment here. So, like, yeah, I mean, we, in all honesty, like, yes, I have a bourbon barrel sitting out there, <laughs> um, but it's it's not our bread and butter. So I don't, we don't yeah. know where it'll end up, but we definitely made it here. I would love to taste that bourbon barrel. <laughs> no, I wish I was in Vermont right now. Well, I mean, this, this was such a unique experience. We can't thank you ladies enough for for setting this and, and letting us taste through it. Um, you know, this is uh, an experience I know that everyone gets and, and I just can't say enough about how interesting and unique each one of these was. And to be able to taste through that progression is, is one of the coolest tasting experience I think I've ever had. So thank you both so much for that. Um, I mean, we do we like the Boss Hog 7, but to, to taste the, these different stuff yeah. is just... No, this was truly an amazing experience. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys taking the time to connect with us to, so that we can learn a little bit more about Whistle Pig and, and get it out to our uh, listeners. Thanks for having us. It's yeah. been fun. Thanks for having us. All right, ladies, we know we got to let you go, uh, but thank you again. This was such a cool experience, and then... We just we are very fortunate to have been here with you today. Um, thank you for everything you do. I seem to kind of still don't you, don't you think you're getting away with those. Uh, but really, thank you for everything you do at Whistle Pig. I mean, we, we are big fans, and uh, you, you've never let us down, and, and we just appreciate the, the opportunity to, to do barrel picks and to taste this tremendous whiskey that you're putting out. So thank you so much. Of course. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Y'all take care. You guys have a good one. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in to the Capital City Bourbon Show. We have more great episodes planned for you in the future, so come back and join us on the porch. Cheers, y'all.